American Journal Club. So we'll wait a few minutes, uh, one or two more minutes for people to join. Um, thank you to Malati again for hosting this. Unfortunately, Prof. Edwin will not be able to join us, um, but Dr. Fidel has graciously and very bravely taken the role of teaching us both GC and LCMS. So thank you very much, Fidel. I think we'll learn a lot from what you have to say today. I look forward to it. And uh, I'll hand it over to you, Fidel. Uh, you're a man who needs very little introduction. So everyone knows who Fidel is. He is the, the leader, I fear this leader in MSA, um, and also a part of the International Metabolomics Society. So he has, has fits many, many feats in many, many places. So he is a man of many talents. <laughs> Great introduction. <laughs> yes, Shank, thank you. Hi, Molati. Hi, Fidel. How are you? Good. Thank you for taking up the, the Zero Club today. I hope to be informative. I have no doubts of that. So whenever you like to start, you can go ahead. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Shen. Uh, thank you, Morati. Um, it's a, a great initiative for this journal club to share, to learn from each other, to share certain concepts and uh, try to understand those concepts and to improve and promote the metabolomics and its application uh, in our different uh, institutions and such. So today, uh, we uh, said introduction to GC or CMS metabolomics and uh, Edwin Madara from Venda was supposed to be part of uh, this presentation, Jano uh, Club. I, I had something that can't make it. So I tried to put together a few uh, material and it's difficult to really prepare something that you don't know the audience that much. Uh, but I put together a few things and uh, then I guess uh, we can take it from those few uh, aspects that we highlight. Uh, maybe more information would come through uh, a question and answer sessions. And please feel free to stop me somewhere in the middle when I present so that it's interactive in a way. And uh, otherwise, we can also at the end have uh, um, questions and answer sessions and anyone is most welcome to chip in. Um, the way then I tried to prepare this uh, presentation, I really used old material that I have some way. And um, uh, let me see. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. So these are some few points that I would possibly touch on. Um, the general metabolomics workflow, which possibly uh, those who attended last, uh, the last journal club would have seen. And uh, most of you who already doing metabolomics, it's nothing new, it's the things that you know. Uh, so I won't really take much into it, but also to highlight where MS uh, based systems are fit and some of the considerations in a, a such workflow of MS based metabolomics and also some strategies. And there is really, a, a, if I may say, a gold standard article that from Olifian is one of the um, 
pioneers of metabolomics, and uh, he really did quite a lot on GCMS metabolomics. And uh, this article really, it's, uh, I would recommend anyone who wants to do GCMS. It's a, a good start. Then if time allows, permits, we can really do a little bit of uh, 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 MS-based metabolite identification. So I will switch from different slides. Um, now um, a second. so metabolomics as a definitions I think um, this you all know um, can simply say it's the study or analysis of uh, all the metabolites in a biological system, uh, quantitatively and qualitatively. And um, over the years, metabolomics has really grown uh, exponentially. This is very even old, seven years old type of graph. So you can imagine now the, uh, the number of the metabolomics or um, metabolomics related research is quite a lot. And um, a non targeted approach is, can be seen as data driven or hypothesis free, where we generate hypotheses through the non targeted. A non targeted type of approach is where you really try to analyze um, uh, all possible metabolites from your sample from the biological system. And why do we study those metabolites? Uh, these the changes in these metabolites uh, carries uh, biologic information on a specific uh, aspect of the study or of that biological system that we're investigating. And uh, uh, in a biological system, biological in a biological systems view. Uh, these ohms or omics, they are inter interconnected, interlinked, and metabolome is the closest to the phenotype. So it provides more biochemical phenotype information. And uh, there is feedbacks in uh, this uh, biological information from different layers. And the more we move from the genes to the metabolites, complexity, biological complexity becomes so high and the regulatory mechanisms are become more complex. And each level has its own importance and uh, not to say that the metabolome is the, the only the important aspect, but in the systems biology, each ohm carries the certain information. Uh, currently, um, the there is a drive to see how we can integrate these different omics information in, to provide the more systems biology understanding of the system. In nature, uh, biology is so complex. If you were to look into the even keg uh, uh, metabolic pathways, biological pathways, uh, it's, uh, it's the model that we are created, presented the maps themselves are so complex. So in a really life, it becomes more, dif uh, more complex. Uh, different analytical platforms are used to try to understand this uh, small molecule, the metabolites. And then um, you have an, um, those who attended NMR journal club session, and uh, there is LCMS, GCMS, etc. And in reality, these uh, analytical platforms, each individually can only measure a very small fraction of the metabolome. And uh, if one wants to really increase the uh, uh, coverage of the metabolome, extracted metabolome, uh, often the combination of different um, uh, analytical systems is encouraged. Um, there is some terminologies, but this changes over time as people, uh, as the field advances. The application of the metabol metabolomics is very um, uh, advancing as the technology advances. 
And um, this biometric, the omics by numbers, uh, so far we can say the metabolites that we know we have identified. Uh, this is an old number, but it's a hundred thousand and even more. And there are more that we do not know. Um, One of the challenge in the MS-based metabolomics, which I in the case also for NMR still, is to be able to tell, to annotate, to identify those metabolites. If you can think of a formula space, this small chemical compounds is as this, the elemental composition or the number of the metabolites that we can really tell, it's really a small fraction. So all this from the analytical technique limitations, the limitation in terms of annotating metabolites, uh, all those are the bottlenecks that limits the biological information that we can generate from metabolomic studies. However, saying so does not mean that though we, the biological information that we get is so limited due to different bottlenecks that metabolomics cannot uh, provide some insight. Uh, different techniques, uh, uh, some normally sometimes classified as NMR-based or MS-based. For the MS-based, we have uh, there is a coupled to chromatographic technique or uh, capillary electrophoresis. For the chromatographic technique, the techniques that are, are coupled to mass, spe to mass spectrometry, uh, often gas chromatography and liquid chromatography. We see the two also have different differences in terms of the type of analytes that can be analyzed on those uh, chromat uh, chromatographic techniques. And those techniques also, uh, the limitation is due also to the either polarity that they can be, hand can be handled, the mass range that can be measured on those um, the machine, but also on the concentration range. These metabolites in, in biological system, they are available at different concentrations uh, level. Uh, this um, the slide just to, for those in, uh, starting metabolomics or new to the metabolomics field, just to know that metabolomics is really a teamwork effort. Uh, it involves different disciplines, uh, biology, chemistry, um, uh, statistics, or data analytics, by, uh, computer science, etc. So it's rare that you can say you can be an expert in all these aspects. You can have a strong point in have some knowledge in different uh, aspects or disciplines of metabolomics, but you are really an expert in one or two of those. Uh, Point. So it's really a teamwork effort. And uh, personally, I, enc I encourage collaborations uh, so that your work that you do in metabolomics is really uh, of great quality. Uh, the workflow then uh, it involves different steps, experimental design, sample prep, uh, sample analysis, where you acquire your data, then you analyze your data or identify the metabolite. Uh, the order doesn't can change depending on the uh, um, the, the method, uh, the tools that you use, uh, interpretation of the um, data that you have acquired, and then sometimes follow up experiments like for experimental validation. It can be linear or non-linear, and I always prefer to have it in a, this way. Uh, it's uh, interconnected; different aspects are connected and uh, each step affect the other or define uh, what you see in the following step. The emphasis is all, uh, often I put on the design of the experiment or study design, because if this is not done proper uh, in a correct way, um, there are downstream steps, uh, you get either confused or stuck. So these are some of the questions that one can pose or consider when you uh, design your study. Uh, the 
biological questions. Uh, if it's a targeted analysis, maybe a hypothesis that you have that you want to, to investigate. If it's a non-targeted word type of question that you are trying to answer through using metabolomics. And the consideration of the biological system that you are interested in. Uh, if, uh, for instance, I want to understand a, a, a different aroma, then in that way already I can, these are the volatile compounds that are being released by the system. So the quick um, uh, things that, the first thing that you think in terms of analytical system to use would be or gas chromatography, which will be able to measure your uh, the volatiles. The other thing would be, okay, how do I capture these volatiles to analyze them on GIS? So what type of um, a sample prep that should I use, type of sample, uh, sample extraction method? Uh, which type of method approach that you want to use? Is it um, targeted, non-targeted approach? And then, um, Sorry a second. And that also um, uh, define the way you will design your study, the way the number of samples that you need, the number of groups, replicates, etc., that you will have to use. If it's non targeted, how are you going to do the uh, extraction of the metabolites, etc., uh, etc. Et so these are some of the questions that you go through when you design your experiment. And um, it's really um, important that you see it, uh, not just to start to say, okay, I'm going to do metabolomics. I need samples, but what is the question? It, it's really necessary to see it and do this uh, study design. In study design, one has to be also realistic. Um, can say I want to do volatile analysis, but the question I do have access to instrument to GC systems that can help you to measure those uh, volatiles. Uh, you want to do um, um, primary metabolites analysis. What type of system that do you want to use to have access to that system? So those are considerations to be done. And uh, there is also ways to do those experimental design using some statistics. And uh, there's a paper that was published uh, just back seven years ago. Uh, you can, I recommend you can read it and provide some information. Um, The analysis that we do, the measurement we do of those metabolites, they need to be extracted from the matrix or biological system of interest. Uh, and the extraction method you use define what you see. Uh, if you want to analyze, let's say, uh, non polar compounds uh, and you extract with water that it's already, you may not be able to get those non polar compounds. Uh, so you see what you extract. And these are some of the articles that you can read, and then um, I will not really go into details. Uh, for GC-based uh, GC metabolomics, uh, GC, as the term says, gas chromatography, and um, uh, it really analyzes small molecule around 600, 700, that one and below and a metabolized compound that are thermostable, uh, volatiles, or the ones that can be uh, put under heat and degenerate gas phase ions that can be measured. So considering then the type of compounds that you are interested in, if uh, those type of compounds that you are interested in and the GC is the suitable the technique for you, then you design a way to extract or to sample those metabolites. If you uh, would want to use um, to do to look at the uh, non-polar, mid-polar, polar compounds, uh, LCMS and the liquid chromatography can be also a good technique. Then, how do I extract those metabolites? What type of extraction method should I use? And each extraction method has its own limitation. And uh, 
if you extract with chloroform, for instance, there is an fraction in terms of polarity of metabolites that you extract. If you extract with methanol, called methanol, there is a class of compound that are favor. If you use hot methanol, there is a class of compound that are favor in terms of the polarity. So each extraction method limits you to a certain class group of compound in terms of the physical chemical properties that are extractable into your organic solvents or whatever the solvent that you are using. So what you extract, what you see is what you have extracted. And uh, often or sometimes if you want to do more, to see more, what happened is to uh, combine different uh, extraction techniques and, uh, and get a wider coverage of your metabolites. Um, depending also on the biological system of uh, that you are studying, and there is different other steps involved to, to do your extraction. You need, of course, if it's um, a tissue, you need them to disrupt the cells to get the, extra, the metabolite out of the cellular components, etc. So if you think then of the a cell biological unit, uh, it has different cellular compartment uh, in which those different metabolites are located. So when we destroy the cell, in a way, what we're measuring is the average metabolome. And um, if one was then to add some spatial information that is lost when you really uh, destroy the cells. With the advancement in technologies, nowadays we are able to do in imaging, mass spectrometry, where you can provide a cellular location or spatial information in terms of the metabolome or metabolites that you have extracted. Um, this paper that was published years back, also where they showed how different extraction methods affect what you extract. And uh, Edwin Madara also did a type of similar study where he was looking at different effect of temperature on pressurized hot water extraction method, it, how that affects different uh, type of extraction uh, metabolites or classes. And we acquire data, we analyze, uh, we acquire um, those samples, we analyze them on um, analytical techniques. Uh, you have now, I think, uh, had NMR uh, session on different consideration in NMR. So there is this mass spectrometry based in, um, techniques. As you can see here, it's really a wide range of what can be done on MS systems. It can be GC, and the GC also has different uh, versions. The single GC, uh, one dimensional GC, or two dimensional GC. The LCMS, there is also a two-dimensional LCMS, and the mass spectrometry system that can be coupled to this chromatographic technique, the range is big. Uh, in terms of mass analyzers, uh, different, but also in terms of ionization. Um, the difference in this uh, mass analyzer so often is really the resolution of the instruments. And, um, here and also the mass accuracy table that shows those differences in mass accuracy. Each technique has um, advantage and disadvantage. I, I'm sure Shane and um, uh, Gerard gave you enough information on NMR, and uh, I will not touch it. And uh, for MS, uh, it is known to, to be more sensitive. Compared to NMR, uh, you can measure quite a number of metabolites in one analysis. Um, above 300 for GC, above uh, 1000 for LC, and um, it's not limited to sample type, um, it gives a global view. And uh, for GC, though we said thermostable uh, compound, uh, there is what they call derivatization, where you can derivatize compounds to make them more uh, suitable for GC analysis. So there is a bit of global, much global type of analysis. Um, in terms of 
prices, it depends really on the system that you buy. Eh? Uh, some are cheap, some are expensive. Yeah, this is an old, uh, an old slide that yeah. Uh, space, your animal, you need enough space, but some mass spectrometry system, they really need space, uh, enough space, and they, they all kinds of consideration in terms of where the, spec, uh, the mass system is uh, placed. However, with the advancement of technology, now mass spectrometry systems that are being uh, designed uh, um, are really uh, small in size and may not need very big space. Disadvantage of mass spectrometry um, is um, isomass, it's really a challenge, and also libraries, especially for LCMS. Uh, the spectral libraries are limited and uh, complex to understand sometimes, and uh, the identification is really a, a challenge. For GCMS, uh, the advantage uh, on, in this case, uh, it was often most of the GC standard GC MS system. The type of ionization used is known as electron impact ionization, which really create a reproducible fragmentation pattern of spectra of a molecule. And that is more reproducible. And uh, with that consistent in the fragmentation that generated from ESI ionization, or no, EEI, electron impact, uh, over the years, uh, people, scientists have managed then to build libraries, GCEI libraries, that it's easy to match and such. So GCMS analysis, it's easy to really do. The identification is made easier. But for LCMS, it's still a challenge, but yeah, there is some improvement being done. The analysis on GC and LCMS, it can be longer and less reproducible compared to any map, yeah. Um, and depending on the column that is on your GC or, or LC, um, the chromatographic uh, can be longer in 30 minutes, one run. So you can imagine if you have 100 samples to analyze, each, each injection taking 30 minutes, so that can take days and weeks. Uh, there is um, also another way to do direct injection in mass spectrometry, uh, direct infusion. Uh, it's very really quicker so that time for GC, is often chromatographic time is uh, shortened, is omitted. So you can analyze quite a number of samples, but that it costs has this advantage on your MS because you are injecting directly into mass spectrometry, a complex samples, complex mixture. Um, how mass spectrometry works? Um, it's a simple, you ionize. I will come back to this maybe many times. Uh, you ionize your samples and you measure your, um, your compounds, your analytes with different ionizations. Uh, here it's electrospray and then you measure the ions. And what you are measuring, it's mass to charge ratio. Often um, people take it by default to say it's, it's mass. It's, it's actually mass to charge ratios. And that's very really, uh, critical. Um, so I'm not sure at what extent I can go into these details, but I will show them and then over with the questions, we can go back to each aspect that we are seeing. One of the ionization method that is used on LC. So as you will see, I will already mix uh, GC and LC in this presentation, not specifically one or the other. I will try to mix them, but then for specific, specific equation for a specific uh, platform, please feel free to say, and then we attend to them to such questions. In the LCMS uh, systems, you know, metabolomics, uh, analytical system, one of the ionization that is mostly used is ESI, electrospray, electrospray ionization. So just you have a capillary uh, on which you apply high voltage and your samples come through, it's a liquid form. And uh, you apply a, a nebulizer gas or a, a, to 
vaporize to evaporize the solvent. And as the droplet comes out from the uh, from the capillary, it's charged, and with the gas, the solvent evaporates. And as the solvent evaporates, uh, the size of that droplet becomes small. And some physics, uh, if you have charges around, some physics will leave, make this droplet split into smaller droplets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the process goes on, goes on until you are left with uh, your analytes in the gas phase that have then picked up a charge, a proton or the protonated or adduct from form. And those ion beams, the ion particles are then channeled into, into mass analyzers. So the gas that often used, I mean, it's a nitrogen. And then on the other side, when we want to do fragmentation, the gas that is used often is the argon. Um, for GC, uh, GCMS, um, uh, you have your GC component here. Uh, you have your column, which is longer, 30 meters, sometimes long. And the oven, where you can then control your temperature. Uh, so in the, in the LCMS, you know, on the liquid chromatography, um, the same, we'll maybe come back to it. You have a column, a liquid chromatography column. Um, it depends then on the type of the LC system. It can be UPLC or HPLC. Uh, the column size then will be different. And those columns can be packed columns in which you have then the particle sizes that differ. The smaller particle size are suitable for UPLC. And um, the chemistry of the, of the column, it can be polar, non-polar. And if it's non-polar, it's the reverse phase. Polar, it's the normal phase. And then the samples are run through the column. They get separated. There is a mobile phase that is used also. You have your column as a stationary phase. Your, in the liquid chromatography, your liquid, your solvents as your mobile phase which can be done or uh, passed through in a, a different uh, ways. It can be isocratic or gradient elution. Isocratic simply means you keep your solvent composition the same. A gradient it means you keep the mobile phase composition. You change it over time. Uh, you do so to increase the resolution, the chromatographic resolution. So that's liquid chromatography. Uh, gas chromatography, the same. You have a column, which is your stationary phase, and your mobile phase is gas. And you can see here, gas. So your samples are chromatographically separated from the column, and they get uh, ionized here. And often the ionization method that I said for GC, uh, electron impact. What happened just um, bonding the analyte, the molecule with electron at a certain image, uh, which is I think 70 volts. And that bombardment will surely not sure. Yeah, it does really fragment the uh, molecules and your molecular ion that generated is very small but you get more fragments. In the LCMS, the ESI that we saw, it is soft ionization and uh, you generate more molecular ions. Uh, there is some um, in-source fragmentation that it can take place, but the majority of the ions that you form are molecular, in the, uh, molecular ion form. For GC, the electron impact, you already, you already destroy your uh, mole molecule into small fragments. So this is just a diagram that shows how the GCs, uh, you have an injector, sample inlet, 
and uh, the column uh, get the separation, and then your MS. And um, most of the simple GC systems in, on the market, but I think now that is that is changing. They have been just quadruple mass spectrometry, just a single mass analyzer, quadruple a single mass analyzer. But nowadays, uh, you that has these changes where you have a, a GC top MS where the mass analyzer with time of flight, of course, with a quadruple in front. So you can then acquire accurate mass. Um, so then GC, the way we simply do the identification of the metabolites is simply because those have patients that you have uh, generated, you can quickly do a match in a database and you get a, a, a ID, a putative ID of the metabolite in your cell. Uh, you, so just for LCMS, this is the diagram where you have your LC component and the mass spectrometry component and um, the chromatography type of different columns that you can have. Uh, the identification in LCMS um, and the spectral libraries are very, are very poor, but there is now an effort from the community to really build this um, um, spectral libraries in for LCMS systems. And the momentum is really growing. And then you also, you are invited to contribute to those spectral libraries. If you have generated some LC or LCMS, spectra that you are confident in, you can submit them into those repositories, libraries. There are people, computer scientists, who sit and do the curation, etc. And uh, you know, the, it, that's how we, we can contribute and make this identification easier. So I will not go into details and the rest of the data analysis, I think it's um, it's also a challenge and going on ongoing effort, but for mostly for both MS-based techniques, the LCGC, you acquire your, your raw data, then you can convert those raw data into a suitable format that's pre-processing. And then you see do simple normalization, the scaling, etc., pre-treatment of the data. And uh, you can apply your statistics, modeling, uh, validation, the feature selection, annotation, interpretation. Here are some of the steps also involved in data analysis. It can be this way, in a flow chart, uh, peak detection, peak matching, retention time alignment, etc. So for both GC and MS, and GC and the LC, uh, there are different tools, softwares that have been developed at each step that can be used to do your peak detection, peak matching, retention time alignment, etc. to generate that peak table that you can use then for your statistical analysis or geometrics analysis. So there are different software for each system, LC or GC. And also those um, software, it's often can depend also on the vein, on the on the man, the vendor, the type of the system that you have, a waters instrument, you may have a software specific for waters, a agilent specific software for agilent, a lico specific software, chrome, chrome TOF, for instance, for GC uh, from uh, lico, etc. However, there is also a open source tools that are being put there that can be used to do those uh, processing of the data. So the spectral data that we generate uh, of this dimension, uh, M over Z and retention time, and uh, so complex and uh, um, as you do your processing, you minimize the noise, you eliminate the noise. And, uh, at the end, sometimes, let's say you have acquired on your chromatographic system, um, on your mass chromatograph, you can see that you have hundreds or thousands of peaks. 
but as you do your data processing, uh, at the end, you may be reporting only 10 or 50 differential metabolites, and it is okay. Um, so in the other way, another way to show that data analysis works well at the end of the day is, am I able to answer my biological question based on the identification on the metabolite that I have measured? Uh, the interpretation, um, I can say the application is quite a lot. So are we, make, are we together so far? Have I lost you, any question? Is anyone on the other end? Can you hear me? <laughs> we are here. Yes, yes, we can, we can hear you. We can hear you. We're still here. Okay, wonderful. So quiet. <laughs> so, are we switch again? Um, There is no one person who knows everything in, in metabolomics. There's no one machine. And I often feel like we are salesmen of our machines. So when I talk about NMR, I try and sell the NMR. And Dr. Fadal, he knows all about GCMS, LCMS, the MS based systems. So I often feel if you need to know about which machine to use, always go to the, the man who knows the most about the machine. Thank you, Shelly. So uh, this, uh, for GCMS, uh, there's uh, this article that I would like to really draw attention to you. Uh, please, uh, it's an old article, but it contains the essential, the fundamentals for GCMS. Um, I will not, just go through it, just I have, I want you to see, to present the article to you. It's from Oliver Fien, he's really uh, one of the pioneers of metabolomics. And uh, you, if you go through the article, it will really tell you what type of the uh, size of the metabolites that are suitable for GC analysis. And also um, what I told you about the libraries, but at the end, uh, some way down, it gives some strategic planning as you do your GC analysis. And they gave an examples of different um, protocols, basic protocols for sample preparation, et cetera, et cetera. So please uh, uh, go read, have this as your dictionary. If you do your uh, GCMS uh, based metabolomics, it's really rich information. Uh, most of the aspects, I have touched them by passing, but here you can read into details and yeah. So I will switch again, sorry. Uh, Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, so for uh, GC, LC, uh, the aspect, the chromatographic aspect of these two MS-based system, um, it's very important. In this presentation, maybe I didn't really put that much emphasis on that aspect that the chromatographic consideration in GC and the chromatographic considerations in LC that you need really to optimize those chromatographic conditions or parameters to get a better uh, analysis. Um, but maybe uh, in questions, session, question, uh, QA sessions, uh, you may be able to say, okay, this aspect you have Consider, etc., depending on the question. Uh, 
in GC, uh, uh, depending on the way you set your experiment for the type of um, um, compound that you are interested in, there is a way you can set your method in terms of the changes of your temperature in your oven temperature so that you can get a better resolution. The resolution meaning uh, the separation of the peaks chromatographic of your analyte on the chromatographic uh, system. The chromatographic separation meaning you have those two phases, a stationary phase and a mobile phase. And GC, it will be your column as your stationary phase and your mobile phase, which is a gas. Then, and the change of that temperature gradient, how will that impact, improve your resolution chromatographically? So that's really uh, of great uh, essential in gas chromatography. And on LCMS also uh, liquid chromatography, you have your column uh, chemistry. It can be polar uh, or it can be non-polar. Non-polar, it's a different also range of non-polar uh, columns that you can have. However, the non-polar is a reverse phase. And then your mobile phase, also the composition of your mobile phase, it depends on the type of the uh, analytes that you want to see, to analyze. Uh, for instance, with experience in the, uh, plant metabolomics, plant type of metabolites, uh, most sometimes, depending on, we have a C18 column in the reverse phase, uh, the mobile phase can be acetonitrile in the water or methanol in the water. And then the gradient that you, the chromatographic method, elution method that you develop, it's really either instrument dependent, column dependent, and also the expertise of the person using the instrument. So those are things that you sit down and you really take time to develop a method. Uh, easier way to develop a method, chromatographic method, or GCMS, LCMS method, it's to have a, a, a pulled sample and then play around and optimize different parameters to get a, a good um, a chromatographic uh, res uh, resolution. However, um, you shouldn't then, um, I wouldn't say you shouldn't kill yourself if your chromatography is not uh, like you see each peak uh, way resolved. It may not be the case in, in the real world, in the reality. As long as you can see that you have a, a really a reasonable good resolution on either on your GC or LC, that's enough. That can be sufficient because you have MS as component also in which also there is a dimension of separation because you are separating your ions based on M over, M over Z, on the M over Z um, values. So have a good chromatography before your mass spectrometry. Why good chromatography before your mass spectrometry also? Because if you have poor resolution chromatographically, uh, you are really, uh, you create a, too much matrix from your, out, uh, outlet, the inlet for mass spectrometry. It can lead to the poor ionization of your metabolites and uh, a poor separation in your mass spectrometry uh, on your analyzers. So a nice, a, a reasonable chromatography is necessary, but a perfect chromatography may not, you may not ever have it, right? And it is okay. And so I, Insist on that aspect, have a good chromatography, BGC or MS or LC, and uh, then uh, mass spectrometry, the optimization of mass spectrometry also, parameters, it's uh, necessary. Uh, there is a, a study I did uh, some times back, a way uh, I looked at some of the parameters in ESI, electrospray ionization source, a way your capillary uh, voltage affects the ions that you form. Your 
other voltages that direct your ions into mass analyzers, like cone voltages, etc. They it affects also the type of the ions that you will measure, you will detect. So that's it, just those two parameters. Literally, they show that yes, depending on the those parameters, uh, the mass, the m over z that you detect are different. So optimization of your mass spectrometry is necessary. Uh, the range, the mass range that you want to measure, uh, the voltages that you apply to do your ionization, etc. For GC, it's really a simple standard, the 70 E volt. And uh, it, it produced, really, it's more, the GC really, it's, it's a simple and straightforward type of analysis. However, there is some complete complications, but it's really easier EI, is really easier to work with compared to ESI. In the ESI ionization, really you create, um, uh, sometimes one can go to the extent to say you create a mess of ions, and different kinds of ions, and you need to pull them into mass analyzers, you need to analyze them, collect. So you might find that the data that you have collected in ESI, LCMS, non-targeted, Possibly 50% are just noise. That uh, noise being your uh, different um, um, and formed, different um, fragmentations that took place, unwanted fragmentations, etc. Et however, again, another however, uh, some of those uh, adduct formed may they may carry some from structural information. Okay. Uh, so they are not just, just, just rubbish. So here I want to go through quickly uh, something about ionization, uh, metabolite identification from MS based. Uh, it's more prone to LCMS, but I think some of you who attended the workshop that we had Northwest, you have seen some of these slides. So I will not really uh, dwell much on them, just a kind of recap, etc. show some of the information. Then in QA sessions, we can maybe uh, be more specific to a specific aspect of the interest. Um, a simple design of what the MS component, you have your inlet, your GCLC, etc. the ionization, different type of ionization that can be done and uh, a mass analyzers. These mass analyzers can be on the my, uh, MS system. Uh, you might find just one, a quadruple, for instance, in, in GC, most of the GCMS systems that have been there, or a co in combination, quadruple time of flight, quadruple ion trap, etc. Then the detection and then data um, measurement. These uh, components are under high vacuum. And, uh, why you want, because you are measuring uh, ions in gas phase and you don't want more any interference in your measurement. Um, identification in mass spectrometry based metabolomics can be uh, in GC when we match the spectra, we are matching the fragmentation pattern, the fragmentation that are collected from EI against a library of spectra that were collected in EI. So if the, the fragments, those uh, fragment matches, we can tell, oh, this is this molecule, right? That's in a GC. In the LC also, the fragmentation information is necessary. Why then this fragmentation provide a kind of a, 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 a point to the molecule? is the way the molecules fragment, uh, it's not random. It follows certain quantum physics, quantum mechanical rules, quantum chemistry rules, etc. And, and that is related to the structure of the molecule. So in a way, what we can say, uh, the fragmentation uh, provides a kind of uh, Noise somewhere. 
Hello. Is someone? Someone with a background noise there? Uh, please mute those who are not talking. Uh, Ibi White. Ibi White. Dramatic mute Ibi White. Morati, are you able to mute Ebi White? I am unable to mute him, unfortunately. Ebi White, are you there? Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. So, uh, as I was saying, the, the molecules with the fragment, they follow certain rules, chemistry rules, etc. So it's not random. So, and that is really, that happens due to the way they are structured. So the fragmentation provides, if one can say, structural, unique structural information. So different structures will fragment differently. Similar structures will fragment similar way. So we can use then fragmentation as a barcode. So taking that into consideration, then there is also a computational or algorithms that are uh, generated or developed to mimic the fragmentation of the uh, molecule. So this in the silico fragmentation uh, can be then used to try to do the annotation of the metabolites. Um, so we have, um, as I when I started what I said, we have really a diverse set of metabolites in terms of chemical structure. And uh, it's so complex. And the ions that we measure, it's either isotopes, hydractins, or insoles, fragmentation, et cetera, and molecular, molecular ion. And sometimes they can they place them here as adducts. And this chart just show uh, those type of different ions that you can generate from one analyte. And as you can see, it's so complex. So in GC, it's easy because there is what they call the convolution of Ion, then we use all the ion as one. In the LC, it is still a challenge. There is a, a, a software approach that is done, SWAT, that tries to mimic the deconvolution in, similar to the GC, but it is still really a challenge. There are computational tools that are being developed and explored and used that helps to do this annotation, but also they have some limitations. Um, um, okay, I will just pass some of here. Um, if in a targeted analysis, things can be easy, uh, made simpler because you know what you are looking for and you can go purchase re uh, reference compounds, chemical references, then that makes your life easier to do the analysis. Uh, annotation and the identification of your metabolite of interest, even from chromatographic um, aspect. Or you can just use your retention time as a, um, an indicator to be able to tell where the compound elute, because if it's uh, a standard, that will, will elute at a certain retention time, and your analyte of interest, if it's present in your sample, will elute a similar retention time. However, this is not really uh, to make things Complex, complicated. Uh, yeah, uh, retention time may not be the only answer because you can have co elution, compounds can behave, but that's just based on polarity behavior of your compounds in a certain chemical space. If then the polarities are dissimilar, even if they are different compounds, then they will co elute in the same time, retention time. But targeted analysis, life may be easier. So then imagine if you don't have those reference compounds, then 
uh, what actually mostly we see we measure a little bit of fraction we know a, a little bit of fraction of what we have extracted or what we have even measured in the instruments uh, i did show you a diagram where you say okay you have collected a number of uh, features let's call them so uh, or chemical signals but at the end you are able to from those 100, 300,000 chemical signals that you have detected, you are able to put a name only on 50 of them. And sometimes that name you have put there, it's just repetitive based on detention time, based on mass behavior, based on fragmentation. Um, um, I will skip this. Um, so in mass spectrometry, you form the ion, uh, you do the separation, trapping, detection, etc. Then you get a, a, a spectra, and you let's assume this your molecular ion of interest, and you want to fragment it uh, to be able to tell what type of structure this compound is. In Accurate mass uh, measurement instruments, your TOF, QTOF, uh, orbit trap, etc. You can use accurate mass measured the, and uh, do the calculation of empirical formula uh, using rules of isotopic matching, etc. That can give you a, a, a empirical formula, a formula to possible candidates. But that empirical formula can be ready of hundreds of Type of structures, right? You can have similar empirical formula but different structures. So adding then this structural information fragmentation, it helps you to narrow your search, your identification of what is the compound in your sample. So you measure, you take your compound, you fragment it, and uh, uh, the fragment that you collect is quite a number of them. So going through this. Uh, MSMS spectra uh, manually, it's, it's a, it can take you years until maybe Jesus comes back, etc. So, there is those ways that have been developed, that are being developed, that can help us to go through uh, this um, MS spectra. As I said again, I'll repeat it your fragmentations, it's way really like a barcode, like a fingerprint. I use example of uh, cups when I'm picking this, this MS uh, fragmentation. That if you have different cups, like cup or tea, when you make a tea and you drink tea in a cup, uh, you can have different shape, uh, different type of cups, but they are cups. They are in a way they have same, same similar shape or basic features that they shape. And if you, let's say you have done a glass, different glasses of different shapes, but it's a glass. If you were to take that, the group of cups and glasses and you throw them on the floor, you break them, you get different pieces. So those pieces that which are your fragments, they are really unique for each cup or each glass. But they may have also some similarities depending on the group. The cups, you have that where you take, you put your, your fingers, right? Or the cups will have that, but the glass won't have it. So there is, it can provide that unique features that, or aspect fragments that can be used to say, oh, these are, these pieces are from cups, they are cups. These pieces are glass. So the same for the molecules, the way they fragment is structural related, structural dependent, following certain rules. So the fragments that you collect in your mass spectrometry analysis in SMS or MS, it's really unique for a specific, those structures that you have. And the fragmentation can be of different, uh, if this is your molecular ion of interest, uh, surely the lower mass would be your fragments and uh, you can have neutral losses, etc. So 
there is different uh, type of formats that you can write. Um, and you can use them then for uh, reconstructing that structure. That's the whole MSMS based identification is to collect the fragments and go backward trying to reconstruct the structure. Um, I will not really go through this. Uh, I, of different mass spectrometry, how do they do the fragmentation, etc. And, and can have a session on this, but yeah. Uh, also, the other thing uh, to take note of, um, in a simple, a simple language, a simple way put, uh, if I do need to do fragmentation mass spectrometry system, uh, let's say in a quadruple, for instance, a triple quad, where you have three quadruples, and, and the first quadruple will do a full scan, scan your M over Z, and you can select which M over Z that of interest that you want to uh, fragment. And your second quadruple we play the role as a, a, a fragmentation cell. And the third quadruple we play a role as selection or scanning of fragments, right? So what happened in that uh, uh, collision cell, in that fragmentation cell, uh, your ion in the gas phase is there and is collided by a molecule of a gas, in this case, argon. So that collision leads to the breakage of bonds. Fragmentation is breaking the bonds in your molecule. So that the molecule of the gas collided with the molecule of your analyte, and that collision leads to the bonds being broken. And the breaking of the bonds leads to the formation of different pieces. And of course, they will follow certain chemistry rules. There can be some intramolecular rearrangement, etc., so that the pieces that are formed are, they, they, they are, energy, uh, they are stable in terms of energies. So, the way that bombardment is happening, you can apply different energies. Uh, you can dictate the way that collision will take place. So if you can imagine two cars that are going to collide head to head, maybe, if the two cars were speeding, let's say, uh, let's say one car is on the constant speed, right? But the other one, you can change the speed of it. So this, the higher the speed, the more the damage will happen, right? When you, due to the collision. Uh, the same for your molecules. Um, the high energy that you apply or voltage uh, uh, evolved to in your collision cell, the more fragment you may form. So different energies in your uh, fragmentation will generate different fragments. Um, so you, the scientist, always you can sit back in your optimi optimization, your experiments, etc. Evaluate your different uh, energies that you apply for your fragmentation and see which one that is suitable. However, as I start, I said so that we are very a, a chemically diverse in terms of structures, etc., in the, the molecule, the metabolites. So the fragmentation of the metabolites may also be different depending on different bond strength that they have, right? The stronger the bond, the more difficult to break the bond. So it may be of, in, of uh, advantage to apply different energies in your uh, fragmentation so that you, op you optimize or you get a more, uh, you cover in, in different, metab different metabolites in terms of fragmentation that you generate in your analysis. So you will see, you will find often in the people reporting that, okay, we have used in, in uh, fragmentation, we used ramping energy from 10 to 40, 10 to 50, 
evolved, etc. So to generate as much as information as possible. Um, so the CIB simply means collision induced dislocation. And um, so I will just uh, do this. Uh, so in LCMS, uh, there is two types of uh, collecting the data, fragmentation information. Uh, there's what is known as data dependent acquisition and there's what is known as data independent acquisition. So the difference between the two is that in data dependent acquisition, you, uh, you predefine what type of uh, ions that you intend to fragment. In data independent, uh, you already open, you open, open the window to fragment as much as uh, uh, metabolites or compound as possible. An example of data independent acquisition is um, a typical mass spectrometry, um, MS to the E, uh, that you find in water's instruments, where you can really, it's like full scans, but with different energies applied. So as the ions go through the uh, collision cells or the, metab yeah, the ions, they get all of them uh, fragmented. Uh, they are both, they have advantages. Advantage, the advantage of data dependent is that your spectra is much cleaner compared to data uh, independent. Uh, data independent acquisition, uh, advantage is that you really, you get, you have more coverage in terms of your fragment or the ion or the metabolite in the end that you, you are able to identify. However, data independent, uh, it's very really a challenge in terms of how you mine your data that you have generated, because you can imagine you are looking at a, a whole ocean of different kinds of fragments. It's so complex, but yes, uh, it's, a, it's a doable. So this is just a workflow for, for your experiment, MS experiment. Uh, do you know this? If yes, carry on this way. If you don't know, carry on this way. So um, uh, I think I might have to stop there. Um, um it's not everything it's really it's like a flash that i have done a flash of different aspects a different uh, aspect in gc in the lc and on ms and um, it's quite a lot in terms of information that is out there please for gcms i repeat i recommend uh, that paper from oliver fian it's really a great uh, like a Bible, if you really do the GC, then based on that, because those, that paper provide really the basic fundamentals on GCMS metabolomics, and you can build on depending on uh, the level where you are and type of instrument that you are using, etc. type of resources that you have at your hand. Um, for LCMS, um, there is a paper by Satan Alwood, um, to remember, I think it's 2010 or 28, 2008, where also it's a similar paper to the Oliver Fian, where they wrote uh, LCMS uh, metabolomics and provided the uh, basic technical aspect and considerations. Uh, but the, the rest and the technology, the way it has been advanced, it's quite a lot be on the analytical aspect of a uh, uh, sample analysis be on the data analysis aspect, on the way you mine, you interrogate your data, and also be on this last point that I mentioned of identification. I we pause on this, and um, uh, with the questions, maybe we can address more different aspects. Thank you so much, Fidel. There, there is a question in the chat box that says, thank you for the presentation. Could you please advise on which MS is more appropriate for non-polar, non-volatile samples? For uh, MS, I'm not sure what you mean. 
but I, if you mean earth um, chromatographic technique combined to the MS for uh, non pora uh, compounds, uh, it depends also on how non pora they are. For liquid chromatography, uh, there is a different uh, C18 column, the base phase columns that can handle some uh, uh, non pora uh, actually is non pora compounds, and you can get really a very a very good separation uh, chromatographically, and uh, for MS, uh, as long as a compound can be ionized. Uh, depending on the ionization uh, technique used, if if the compound can be ionized in ESI, can be ionized in EI, that compound can be analyzed on your uh, MS system. Uh, for as I said, now uh, now with the advanced technologies, now there is a way that now you can do this ambient ionization where you do your imaging, uh, your MALDI. Uh, matrix assisted laser desorption ionization. And uh, if compound is um, ionizable in that form with that ion uh, ionization method, yes, it can be measured in MS. So on MS component, that if a compound is ionization ionizable, yeah, it can be then analyzed on the MS, MS analyzer. Then that depends on what you want to do for the GC, uh, EI, if that compound has, is ionizable with EI, you create a pattern of fragments, which you can search against libraries. On the ESI, and then either you can then add um, different steps of mass analyzers, uh, your TOF to get accurate mass measurement, your fragmentation to get your structural information, etc. Uh, there is also, uh, I think you mentioned what does happen in, in either on GC or LC. In GC, different different reason. For GC, uh, if a, a compound cannot be is not thermostable or it needs to enhance the uh, volatility in the GC system, they do the devatization. Uh, so that's from chromatographic side. On LC, sometimes you can do what they call the vaporization to enhance, to improve the ionizability of the compound. So that all of those specificities will depend then on you, the scientist, with the type of the compound that you have at hand that you need to want to, to, to analyze. I'm not sure whether I you are satisfied, Le Rata? Are there any other questions? You can raise your hand and ask verbally if you like. Happy Sola, you have a question. Um, sorry, I didn't get the paper you recommended for the LCMS. Okay. Uh, I, I will look for it quickly. Uh, either type it in the chat or I will pass it to the MS uh, communication team and they will distribute the reference. Okay, thank you so much and thank you for the presentation. Most welcome. And uh, maybe there will be a follow-up where possibly uh, you can indicate different aspects because this was really a general overview, then different aspect of interest or on which you want to, to get more information or understanding. And we can then prepare um, either a workshop or another journal club with a specific zoom into that specific aspect of interest. I see someone with a hand. Hi, Doc. Uh, doc. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Okay. 
Thanks for the presentation. Um, I wanted to check if you do have a paper for GCMS where a work has been done using GCMS. Uh, you want you want a paper where there have been GCMS analysis reported, right? Yes. Okay, let me write it down, then I will associate that with the MSA communication team and they can distribute those papers. Yeah, there is a number, of, there is a, a OLIFM, they have published quite a number of papers on GCMS, another group in Germany, where they also be one of those old uh, group that started or published a lot on GCMS, so I can share some of those papers. Okay, thank you. I think it'll be great also for us to have future um, journal clubs where we talk about these papers. So the papers that you're suggesting, Fidel, you, maybe some people can present them and we can talk about them on a critical level as well. Yeah, you say, Shen, if we can. Yeah, the, the papers that you're going to suggest to us that the communications committee will send out. Maybe we yeah. can have a future journal club and go into more detail of those papers. Yes, that also that's another possibility. So yeah, the, the, the introduction that we've done today and, and the previous journal club was a very broad general introduction. There's mm. obviously a lot more specialization into these fields. And um, Chanel has shared a link here uh, for the forum for uh, everyone to come join. So you can introduce yourself, ask questions, discuss projects. So please do join. We want to have a nice communication going on with the MSA community. And we have a, a little link over here at MOOCLAP um, with some suggestions for future topics for Journal Club. So this is an anonymous um, app, a MOOCLAP. And you can go there and just share your thoughts and ideas of what you'd like to see in the future journal clubs. Mm. And we are very friendly people. Don't be scared of us. We are here to discuss and chat about these topics. So if you have more direct questions, don't be afraid to message us, email us. Um, yeah, hopefully in the future we have some more um, focused journal clubs. Yes. So, um, thank you again, Fidel. Thank you, Shen. Thank you, Fidel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mahati. And we hope to see you in the next Journal Club. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, wish you a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Thank Anza, so and everyone else who's put an effort into this. Yes, Anza, Chanel, and Keke. Yes. Communications community. Yeah, doing a great job.